Ladies and gentlemen, he's here today. One of the first DJs to broadcast on Radio One. He has presented over a hundred episodes of Top of the Pops and has given away over one million Cracker Jack pencils. Yes, it's Ed Stupont Stewart. Hello. 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 One million pencils. How accurate is that? Well, just, uh, just below. <laughs> just below. Yeah, <laughs> so not it, quite the million. No. No, it was a million. But it's just below what it really was. Yeah. Which was about four million. Four no, million? No, it wasn't <laughs> exactly right. We never counted them because we weren't. You see, they were never uh, put out uh, to the public on, in a shop or no. on retail. So they were the never... Aim, the Eamon Andrews organization, uh, which owned the copyrights and everything, wouldn't allow, allow it. So, so even today you can't get a Cracker Jack pen. So you can't get a Cracker Jack no. they, they were never marketed. They were no, never, never marketed. They were, they were never, a BBC never thought no. we could make a fortune here. Well, no, it wasn't only that. It was also down at the, uh, down at the theatre. Yeah. Um, I did Panto there one year, 1978. And um, we got the people in from, uh, from the Eamon Andrews organisation to say, come on, let's, let's mark. No, not interested. Not interested. So none of the audiences ever got Cracker Jack pencils. or no. Nothing. No, because ah. they didn't. They didn't want to. They missed a trick. Oh, didn't they miss a trick? Anyway, yeah. I can anyway. go anywhere. As well. Last night I was at a thing for the Friday Club just down the road, and I walk in and I go, Cracker Jack! And the whole place yells, still to this day. Still, Cracker Jack! Still they get still, a reply. They still do Cracker yeah. Jack. Yeah. So every time you say Cracker Jack... Cracker Jack! Cracker Jack! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. And that was recorded in the BBC uh, Theatre in Shepherd's Bush. Shepherd's Bush? Yeah. yeah. That's where we were recording Cracker Jack. Uh, and um, and exactly where we went, you know, it was a, it was just the word of the of the decade, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was it was extremely popular. It was popular when um, I was a little bit younger. I won't I won't elaborate on how younger I might have been, but yeah, but it was great. I can tell your age by who you remember as the presenter of Cracker Jack. Well, I remember you. Yes, and later. There was Stu Francis. Stu Francis, yeah. he was the one who finished it, yeah. Yeah, the, the, he finished it. <laughs> it was a 30-year run. It started in 1955 30 years. and ended in 1985. Fantastic. And to this day, I've never understood why they dropped it. Yeah. Well, do you think it would, um, it, it's something that they could bring back today? Oh, yes, easily, because it's so simple in its, in its format. Uh, not only shouting the word Cracker Jack, but yeah. they, had, they had good groups on there. They had, uh, you know, actors like Peter Glaze and Bernie Clifton, Tom McLean, Jan Hunt. Everybody I remember all them, yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful show, but I just, they just suddenly said, we think we've had enough. I did a radio show with Bernie Clifton at Christmas. Oh, um, did you? Yeah, I was up in Sheffield doing oh, Panto. Yeah, right. And Bernie does a show on um, a Saturday. Uh, I, it's a really simple title, I can't remember what it's called, but Bernie, he's got all the old age pensioners in and they're all sat there and he's got them in the palm of his hand and it's great, it's like a, have I got news for you, he's brilliant. Yeah. Oh no, he's brilliant, he's one of the old style entertainers who never stops and he never stops working and he he, lives, he's yeah. got his house in, was it, Chesterfield, just around there. That's it, yeah. And um, he's always been a great mate and, you know, from the time he had the ostrich and all the, all the birds and, yeah. and all that. And you still keep in contact with old Bernie, then? Oh, yes, yeah? because he and I are both uh, members of the Grand Order of Water Rats. So, ah, yes. So I'll, I'm sure I'll see him. I think I'm going up. We have a northern one every year up in Manchester, and I'm going to go this year, and he's bound to be at that. So we have a meeting, a lodge meeting. Yeah. And we go up in a coach well, from London and uh, have a riotous time and then come back again. Give him my regards. T- um, Tony Rudd says hello. He's Tony Rudd, yes. Yeah. To- Tony, that's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's me, Tony Rudd. Yeah, all the stars are here. <laughs> the stars are here, right? I've been I've been looking up a few other things. You were born in Devon, Exmouth. Exmouth, yes, in yeah. the middle of an air raid, and they said a shame they missed. <laughs> yeah, because it was nineteen forty one. Forty one. I've got married the place called Caroline House, which is funny in as much that later on on the pirate ships, I didn't work on Radio Caroline. I worked on Radio London, but Caroline was the name of the house I was born. So in. yeah, so you didn't do Caroline. I remember you did no, London. I did London, yeah. I never did Caroline. No. And who were the DJs? I remember Kenny Everett was on there. Kenny Everett, Tony Blackburn, um, just about all of the ones that made it, uh, or, or, shall I say, on the big time, were, were on Radio London. One or two were on uh, Simon D, especially on Caroline. But uh, DLT was on Caroline, North. And um, so there's all sorts of people. So in those days, were you aware at the time that you were really pioneering oh, what, yes. what was to come with radio? Yes, in our life? because we suddenly realised that you know, everywhere we went, people would say, oh, are you one of those pirates? Oh, thank goodness <laughs> there's a radio station we can listen to now, because the BBC, bless them, never even saw the, 
the, the, the possibility or probability of a 24-hour uh, yeah. pop music. And pop they, music, yeah. They would have Saturday Club, they would have one or two special programs, which were all very good, but they wouldn't dare go every minute of every day which is what the Pirates did. Well, that's what they did, yeah. And, uh, of course, everyone loved the Pirates. And you've, you see these uh, great scenes of people listening to the Pirates and holding their yes. uh, covers over their heads so they could listen to them in secret and that's stuff right, like that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, people were caught like, having their radio under the pillow case, under that's the it. pillows yeah. in bed or in the dormitories or whatever. Because the Pirates, they, they revolutionised music as we know it. What we, what we see every sort of show that's on radio now the music they play, they play music from the charts. Of course, BBC wouldn't do that at the time. No, at the time they wouldn't. We had a format, and the guy, Ben Tony, um, who was our programme director, was a Texan, was American, and he brought the American Top 40 format over to the Pirates, especially us on Radio London. And so let me give you the format every half hour. There was a, we, you started your programme with a record from the 1 to 10 in the chart. Yeah. Right, and we had our own chart, which reflected the, the big energy yeah. the charts. Really. Then you had an 11 to 20. Then you had a climber, which is one of the new records. Yeah. And then you had a revived 45, which I think is one of the greatest terms ever for records, which was an oldie. Yeah. And then you went back on that same four again and then had maybe an LP track as well. So every half hour, you just repeated that format. And so you knew that in the hours, well, three hours you listened to a program, you would hear the top 10, and you would hear a lot of the 11 to 40s. And then you'd play the new records. We all had a climber, record of the week. I remember my first record of the week later became a huge hit for Edwin Starr, of whom I'd never heard, but I just loved Stopper on Sight, SOS Stopper on Sight. Yeah. And I made it my record of the week, my first one, and it became a hit. And so every time I hear that now, I'm back bobbing on the North Sea waves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that like on the North Sea? Wasn't it off Frinton on Sea? Yes, off Frinton on Sea, and it yeah. was a, an old um, minesweeper, Liberty ship, from the uh, U.S. Navy. And um, when it came over, it anchored up two, uh, what was it, uh, three and a half miles off. Yeah. So you used to get there by tender, which in the early days went from Harwich and later went from Felixstowe. And so you're on, and you're on the ship, and then you're in international waters, of course, and that's why, how we got away with it. That's it, because you and needed we to be legal. international. Yeah. And they kept trying to say, oh, no, you're, me you're messing up with the shipping lines and the radio broadcasts and ships, and there's a and which is a load of cobblers, in actual fact, because only once did anything happen which might have uh, uh, caused a, sort of a breakdown in communications. Or a, I think it was a... I remember Pete Brady, who was the first DJ, the breakfast DJ on Radio London, and... Uh, he saw a plane, I think it was a plane, crash into the sea, not badly. And uh, he and a couple of others went out and rescued them the, from, the, from the plane because it was so near the ship, it never yeah. hit the ship. So it's, it's quite, so there's, so there's all sorts of stories which are forgotten about. Um, and they were well, it's quite an adventure, really. I mean, oh, it was a huge adventure. Yeah. But then, then when the government decided they didn't like it and the BBC should be doing this and not pirates or people supposedly making it, being a danger to shipping or... Um, you know, not charging for advertising and all this sort of thing, which, of course, the BBC didn't do, weren't allowed to do. It wasn't part of theirs. So, but we created this demand. So when Radio 1 started on September the 20th, 30th, 1965, uh, 67, um, you know, it was, it was something very new, but they employed all of us. Mm. And then whoever stayed and did well stayed there, and if you didn't, you... I always compare it to somebody sticking decorator's glue up on a on a wall to put some wallpaper up, you know, and then yeah. if it's stuck with your name on it, then it's good for you, you <laughs> stay, you know. Um, yeah, see, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I can only imagine what it'd be like, you know, with, with all them DJs all living on one ship. Was it a bit of ego? Well, yes, it was, it, there were about um, ten. Yeah. Plus crew, of course. Yeah. Uh, and who were all Dutch, who all came from uh, Amsterdam or The Hague. And uh, they were, they were the, the company that supplied us with food, um, yeah. water. We allowed two bottles of Heineken beer a day. That was our ration for alcohol. And um, they supplied everything that kept us going, and uh, including all the stuff for the mast and the transmitter and this and that. So it was sort of Anglo-Dutch. But then Dan Holland had their own uh, DJ, uh, their own pirate radio show called Veronica. So Radio Veronica was very big. The same. Yeah. In, in Holland, but we yeah. were heard in Holland as well. I mean, the northern part of Europe. Of course, yeah. Very yeah, big yeah. with yeah. Caroline and London, yeah. Yeah, and then from the Pirates, 
You moved it. Did you move straight to uh, Radio well, 1? Well, there was a four week gap between the end of the Paris on the 14th of August and the start of the uh, Radio 1 on September the 30th. Yeah. And the first voice was Tony Blackburn, as we all know. His was the only program of the day to have 100% needle time. By that I mean. I remember needle time, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. able to play all records.